Chris, you're, you seem to be in awe and in fear of Facebook, and naturally we all are, but looking at Facebook where it is now, is not it like Ford Motor Car Company compared with Toyota and perhaps another group like WeChat, which is originally Chinese based, social media may take it over. Because that's number two at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and it has a seamless, doesn't have that sort of uh, profile, uh, firewall between profile and, 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 and pages. I'm not sure if I'm in fear of Facebook, I'm certainly wary of it, but you made the, the, the comparison to, the, to Ford and the new Ford, uh, or what, how people must have perceived Ford when it first came out. Um, Ford's designed to get you where you want to go based on the decisions you make, but Facebook's not designed that way at all. Facebook's designed to influence what you think based on the information. Uh, it's, it's actually designed to make you spend money, that's its fundamental purpose, but it's, it's not going to go where you necessarily ask it to go. It's going to heavily influence uh, where you want to go. And if I had a Ford motor car that I actually did have a Ford that used to do that, and uh, I wrecked it <laughs> into a tree. Um, so uh, John asked me a question uh, uh, during the break, which, which relates to this. Uh, he made a, made a point that uh, his um, I might be ruining your question, John. Oh, you, you, you are. Oh, I am, but I'll ruin it anyway, because it's more fun. Anyway. Yeah, I'll only ruin half the question. I'll leave the first half. Uh, but the, the point John was making is that his Facebook page seems to him recently to be coming less relevant. One of the... That, that's actually... I've never heard anybody say that before, because I don't know how much you all know about what information Facebook gather about you and what information Twitter and all social media gather about you but the, the scientific theory is, and it really is impervious as a scientific theory, the more uh, you do online the more relevant your Facebook should become because the more information they collect about your interests and your hobbies and the people you interact with the more targeted uh, the information and the advertising uh, comes to you. So. I take your point, Kingsley. I, I am in awe of Facebook. I'm not so much in fear of it um, because I, I just think it's a new way of controlling information and I've never been a particular fan of mainstream media who used to make the judgments on how information was presented to you anyway. It's just a different group of people deciding on what you should and shouldn't know. Um, but in the case of Facebook, they're doing it um, with no journalistic background uh, whatsoever, but they're also doing it quite secretively through algorithms, and I think that is, uh, well, it's scary to me. And having said I don't fear it, I probably do. I'm going to be 100% honest. I think it's a pretty scary uh, prospect. Well, um, well, yeah, um, John Hallam, and I'm with the uh, People for Genetic Disarmament and the Human Survival Project. Actually, as, as you spoke, the penny dropped. Um, of course, Facebook has realised that I have no money and that I'm not interested in buying anything. I'm only interested in saving the planet from incineration, which is what I do for a living. But I have either 595 or 795 Facebook friends. I have no idea who they are. Um, I never meet them. I don't know them. Um, but Facebook is a great platform. And as he pointed out, um, I have found that um, my interactions with Facebook are becoming less and less meaningful and that basically all I do now is use it as a place to paste a URL for an article or a press release that I have written. Uh, the same with Twitter. Uh, both Facebook and Twitter consistently um, ask me for my entire um, email address list, which includes the whole of the United Nations General Assembly, um, which I therefore refuse to give them. Um, Is there a question coming, John? I, yes, I'd love you to comment on that experience. I can comment again, not in possibly hugely, from a hugely well-informed position, but yes, just with Facebook, um, actually, I have a little bit the same experience in finding that I'm, I'm more just 
Like, for example, I had a small story come out today in a thing called City Hub on West Connects, and I posted that up, you know. So I am posting things up, but, but I've got about um, 4,500 friends. Now, it goes without saying that I don't know those friends. I literally don't know them. Um, I tend to, at a certain point, I realised that I was being sort of targeted by some very religious people, um, I think from, mainly from Nigeria. <laughs> so so I, I started sort of realising, you know, I don't want religious crap on my Facebook, so I sort of weeded them out, and then I set up a principle, if someone's got about 20 mutual friends, I will accept them as a friend. Now, then I feel a bit bad about that because I think, what if someone's really lonely out there? <laughs> what if they're my Facebook friend and, and I'm kind of isolating them? Because, look, the truth is, and this is where I think I am a little bit sucked in, um, and I'm really glad to be here tonight to hear Chris remind me about the whole corporate sort of corporatism of the thing and the whole control of the communication. Because, you know, I do have friends, uh, some older friends who are not well and out in the country who, for whom Facebook has become very important as a sort of connection with a few other people who otherwise they wouldn't see. So it is a sort of does have a social function. Now, what I would really want to know more about is this uh, whole idea Chris spoke about. Like, there must be, there's some extremely um, good open source non-commercial computer people around. One of the things that I particularly follow is um, a site called Right to Know, which if you want to have a look at that, that shows you, if you can go into that and do a freedom of information request and everyone can see it and everyone is helping. And, you know, so these skills are really important. I'd like to see those skills, uh, to, but I think it's going to be very hard to, to confront the commercial power of Facebook. You know, so some of these things are going to be small and then they're going to be taken over. But I would like to see a challenge to it. Well, I didn't know when you had so many um, links to Nigeria. Because <laughs> I have a Facebook friend who just won $7 million in the Nigerian lottery. <laughs> <laughs> and he sure needs... they didn't win it from him. <laughs> no, he definitely won it and he needs help getting the money out. So I'm talking to a... He's a prince, actually, the son of a prince. <laughs> um, I don't know why everyone's laughing. It's, just, it's on Facebook. It must be true. Um, I, I have I, I, I have only half of Wendy's uh, friend base. So I'm ashamed to say I've got about 2,700 friends, most of whom, admittedly, I don't know. Um, and look, uh, I, I think generally uh, the, the, there's a there's a brilliance about, about Facebook in that. Um, you end up with a lot of friends who have uh, like views, and that's actually quite reflective of real life. I don't hang out with many hardcore liberals, I've got to say. Uh, actually, I was raised by one, but that's the only one I know. So, <laughs> so, um, so it, it does reflect uh, real life to some extent. And, and, uh, but the downside of that is it does become a megaphone. I, I don't pretend to be an unbiased journalist. I'm thoroughly 100% biased. I'm an absolute uh, died in the wool lefty journalist. I don't give a bugger what uh, conservative journalists say about my journalism. As long as it's truthful, I'm, I'm comfortable. But I am always mindful that the stories and information I get, on, particularly through Facebook, is a megaphone of people with like-minded views. And I think the risk of uh, Facebook and social media is that, for, particularly for younger generations coming through, that the, the megaphone of social media will polarise more strongly the views of individuals and it will, it will more clearly define left versus right. And I don't necessarily, well, I mean, we all know right wingers are wrong and stupid, but, but let's pretend that that's not the case. Uh, you know, getting views from the other side is not necessarily a bad thing. So, and Facebook doesn't do that. I haven't had a right wing nutter uh, come up through my Facebook wall for God knows how long, with the exception of Andrew Bolt. <laughs> okay, next question. Well, I, I'm of the opinion that when you're afraid of something, the problem lies with you, not with the object that you fear. And my experience in Facebook tells me otherwise. I've actually have friends whom I disagree with all across the world. 
We keep in touch with Greece, what's happening in Spain, Italy, Portugal, the Philippines, Canada, the United States, from the left, from the East Coast to the West Coast. And I get a diversity of views. And I think what we are losing is an opportunity to cooperate with that medium rather than fear it, rather than people tell, telling people not to even rely on it. Now, if you don't like that medium, here's my challenge to the alternative media. Develop your own. Where is it? Where is it? And if you want to develop it, then ask around. That idea is possible. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to... Uh, I, I take your point. Um, you said if you're afraid of something, it more reflects on me. I'm afraid of Tony Abbott, and I don't think that reflects on me at all. Um, I, I'm particularly afraid of a naked Tony Abbott with a gun, which is how I frequently picture him, and that's maybe is a comment on me. Um, we have, we have though, developed our own media, and that's New Matilda. Um, Wendy's the contributing editor, and I'm the editor. But um, the reality of what we do is that our media is very much, it's small independent media, and it is to some to increasing degree a hostage to social media. And unfortunately, the horse has already bolted on that front. Uh, as Wendy said, tackling the corporate power of Facebook is going to be very difficult. And when I was talking before, I, I mentioned a, a new app called, I think I called it Ideas. It's actually called Minds, M-I-N-D-S. Uh, there's an app on the phone, and it's a transparent social media, uh, if people want to check it out. But I take your point, but uh, we are doing our own media in a sense. Yeah, I'd just like to say, and I, I don't mean this in a hostile way, but like saying go and start your own or it's all fine um, despite this corporate power reminds me a little bit of Malcolm Turnbull who has always been a very, it's great with the media, we've got this great market out there, anyone can start you know, their own media. Well, you know, he's got, you know, he was a merchant banker, he's an enormously wealthy person. So this sort of market idea that we can all start our own um, is, I think, a little bit of, a, of an illusion, actually. Um, and I, but I would say, like, one journalist I wanted to mention um, is another journalist at New Matilda who's called Amy McGuire. Now, this is how uh, something like New Matilda can give the opportunity to someone to build up their credibility. Now, you know there was this whole meeting at Kirribilli House with all these Aboriginal leaders and the whole list was secret and it was sort of very much a cooked up meeting. You know, I read today on New Matilda, I actually, I got it off Chris's Twitter and then I went to Amy McGuire's article on that meeting and that is really worth reading. You know, I really felt, and she is a young, younger, Indigenous journalist, a woman, who has got a really strong take on Indigenous politics and she is getting a voice and I think a credibility through having that, um, that platform on New Matilda, which is why you know, we're always sort of trying to struggle to get um, more resources for it, just like politics in the pub. That was a little bit of a promo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, my name is Brian Conkin. Um, um, like the previous fellow, um, I, I've got a lot of um, followers on Facebook who, um, I don't know who the hell they are. I've got two and a half thousand, most of them are pro-Palestinian, free Palestine. But um, yeah, um, occasionally they put um, porn on my um, page and uh, different stuff to defame me. But I don't know who the hell they are. But, um, yeah, my question relates to 9-11. Um, it happened 12 years ago, and it's been pretty much thoroughly exposed on the social media. It's been an inside job uh, by Mossad and covered up by FBI and CIA. Um, you've got Lucky Larry Silverstein, the um, pullet, and um, anyway, all the rest of it. But besides it, can I, can I just say that besides um, all the information that's come out about 9-11, 12 years ago, the mainstream media is still not touching it. It's like they're, they're ignoring it. it. 
do you think they're, they're trying to pull uh, World War Three with um, China and Russia but before they can, uh, like, well, what's going on? Like, it's an obvious inside job. I have a personal view about why um, the media don't uh, embrace the 9-11 story. Uh, and it's my personal view, and, and I will say in my defence before you get upset that it's a very well-read personal view, because I've taken a sincere interest in this. I think the media don't uh, get involved in it because the conspiracy is absolute nonsense. <laughs> uh, genuine nonsense. Um, the only conspiracy I've seen more nonsensical is the one associated with Chappelle Corby. Um, and, and actually, no, no, 9 is more, more crazy than Chappelle. Um, and we, we'll argue about it later, I'm sure, over beer. I've read about it extensively, and um, the, the argument is basically that, uh, what is it, 5,000 engineers have now said um, they believe that 9-11 was an inside job. Um, 95,000 have said they don't. Um, you know, it's not always the case that the majority wins, but in this case it is. Um, I, but I will say, even though we disagree about that particular conspiracy, we may agree on others. And one of the brilliant things about social media is the capacity of people to promote views that aren't necessarily uh, accepted by the mainstream. And Wendy touched on this when she was talking herself. I think that's... Well, I should have probably talked about it more in my talk. I think the brilliance of social media is that it has taken away some of the power of the mainstream press, and I don't think that's a bad thing at all, because I think <laughs> that the judgments made about news values, even though you and I disagree about 9-11, the broader judgments made about news values are not democratic, and they're not necessarily done in the best interests of communities. They're done traditionally in, in, in Australian media for a profit and for reasons that you and I will never know. And I love the democratic nature of social media. I don't, I don't love the 9-11 conspiracy theory, although I, I probably do, because I've probably read as much about it as you have, I just don't believe it. But I love the uh, democratic nature of it, and I think um, if that's what floats your boat, if you, uh, if you love conspiracy and uh, you want, want to share it, well, social media is the place to do it. But if you think mainstream media is going to jump in, uh, you're going to be sadly disappointed. And if you want to believe that that's a conspiracy, I'm not going to be that surprised. Okay. You've lost all credibility. Fair enough. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I was thinking about uh, Facebook. It's a, it performs a social function, uh, communicating and disseminating information. People increasingly, and independent media relies upon it, or is interlinked with it. Perhaps as a solution, we should look at perhaps... Um, democratising this corporation, because it can stymie and limit the free flow of information, that should be a maybe political objective that we should be taken up. I know that Luke Foley at the National Labor Conference is going to uh, suggest overthrowing the social subjective, the yeah. original socialisation of the means of production, distribution and, and exchange. Maybe we should be looking at extending it into communications and to, into the new social media platforms. Yeah. Democratise it, take it away from the power of the corporations, make it a true, make it a true commons that we can all benefit from this wonderful technology. That's a possible suge suggestion of... Yeah. Yeah. I think you've really got to find out you know, some information. You know, who, who are the people out there who are attempting this? There's a thing called GitHub, which is re really good where you, know, you can put up documents and um, you know, anyone can uh, share them and help edit them. And you know, there are a lot of democratising things happening. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, for say someone like myself, I really have to be in a position of supporting people who want to do that. I don't actually have the skills to do it. But that I, one of the things I do think is a hell of a lot of great younger, uh, younger than me, um, computer people out there who really support democratisation of information and there should be a, a lot of linking with them. Thank you very much for your talk, Chris and Wendy. I'm a bit surprised that you didn't mention the article on New Matilda by one Julian Assange recently, which points out that Google has got a hotline to the NSA in America, and he goes into great depths in that article about how Google 
and Facebook and all the rest of them are all being stored in big databases by the CIA and the NSA, and uh, which complements the uh, metadata law here in Australia. That's why I keep bringing out my little print flyers, which Stuart will uh, read out at the end. But I'd like you all to go to the Agent Orange Justice website and pick up the flyer and, uh, and spread it around on your Facebook pages, please, to help publicise this Agent Orange benefit miracle. Um, on Google, though, there was this lovely article on Victoria Street. You just Google Victoria Street Resident Action Group and you get a beautiful article there giving the whole history of the struggle. It's been up there for 10 or 15 years. Mentions you and Teresa, of course. But I just threw that in as a side. To me, my print media bible these days is the Saturday paper, which I read along with everyone sending me stuff from Court Watch, New Matilda, and Amy Goodman's uh, Democracy Now! in the States um, and NoamChomsky.com, of course, for the, uh, for the diehards. But uh, I am postulating to you that the reason why Tony Abbott's ministers are probably too scared or told not to go on Q&A is not because Greg Sheraton can move to the left of both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party, as he did this week, in uh, answering a particular question about how the Labor Party is covering up on the political donations, etc., etc., but because of the little bylines from the tweets going underneath, which expose all the speakers for their parliamentary rigmarole and doublespeak. The tweets that go underneath from so called ordinary people, and this is one of the things they're going to be investigating, are so spot on sometimes in exposing the crap that the Q&A mainstreamers on the platform are coming out with. So, you know, in that sense, that's, I'm just throwing all this in as an aside, but I'm just saying, can you reflect on the, uh, the Google situation uh, with, I think it was in you, Matilda, anyway, uh, from uh, Julian and the Edward Snowden stuff. Look, the Google, um, I, I've got a real thing about Assange. I, 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 I don't, I've been in media 20 something years, 20, 25 years, well I think Wendy's got a bit more than that, but uh, I've never seen someone so comprehensively used by the media and celebrated by the media and then dumped by the media. Um, whatever you think of the charges Assange is facing, um, his, his absolute use by the media for their own ends and then um, total disinterest, I, I think is indefensible and outrageous. And, what Assange writes about Google uh, is 100% true, and we, we actually, Ange, my beloved partner up the back, will back me up on this. We had uh, a visitor to our office uh, last night uh, for not nefarious reasons, but turns out this person used to work for a very high-profile crime agency um, and gave us some advice about the things we need to do to ensure the security of our our, our fundamental interest is the security of our relationships with sources. We quite infamously uh, found ourselves in court last year over a, a source, a whistleblower, Freya Newman, uh, who was prosecuted by the New South Wales Police. Now Freya, unfortunately, had done something that, that we couldn't prevent, which uh, exposed her, but more generally, um, it is one of the biggest fears I know I have, and I'm sure Wendy has, um, is how you protect sources and keep them safe. And I like what Wendy said about um, Glenn Greenwald because that's his, his mantra. Um, but it is, uh, social media is, is one of those traps where uh, you can be linked to a source uh, via social media. We often get scoops and um, tip-offs through social media. But more broadly, in relation to Google, the information they gather uh, would would stagger you. I mean, that's why Edward Snowden is hiding in Russia, because he tried to explain to people the depth of that information. Um, and social media, I think Snowden has said it, and I think Greenwald has said it, and I think Assange has said it. Social media and Facebook is one of the greatest nets to catch all that information um, that, 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 that has ever been created. Uh, and that's one of the pitfalls of social media. And I guess my point is um, it's a real double-edged sword. For me as a publisher it's a double-edged sword because they can 
shut me down tomorrow if they choose to. But for you all as users as well, it's a double-edged sword. You may enjoy the interaction you get with social media, but it is absolutely coming at a price. And it may not be a price you're aware of now, and it may not be a price that you ever have to pay. Um, but if you ever become a whistleblower, I can tell you, or, or someone who is in the gaze of um, the rabid Murdoch media, social uh, media, uh, may well be a price um, too much for you. Yeah, I agree with um, what Chris has said, but also if I was becoming an investigative journalist today, um, I would really um, need to have a lot of skills in uh, protecting sources in technical ways that I don't have at the moment. And that would affect me in terms of uh, what sort of stories I might do. I'm quite amazed that occasionally, you know, someone will post in the direct, you know, messenger thing on Facebook, you know, this is strictly off the record information. And I'm sort of thinking, well, no, actually, it's not. And so I even, for example, um, I won't give you the particular example, but say I'm involved in something, this is more of a political thing, and I want to um, say I think we need to delay, disrupt, whatever, uh, this process, I would now not put that in an email. Uh, I really think you have to work on the assumption that everything you're saying is is able to be surveilled. Now, you know, when I was younger, my phone was tapped. We knew when our phones were tapped, you know, go click, click about every 45 seconds, and everybody knew. But um, but now, of course, you just have to see, assume that the lot is under surveillance. Now, that doesn't mean I think people need to get into it totally if you're not dealing in that sort of information. But if you are, you know, journalists who don't take it seriously, um, and then set themselves up as people who are prepared to receive confidential information. I think awareness of this has, has grown a lot in the last year. Um, I really think uh, they needs to, you know, they really need to develop their skills to a much higher order than what, for example, mine would be. Hi, Chris and Mandy. Um, I'm on both of your Facebook friends list, and my name's Richard, and, and um, I'm a journalism student. So one issue that I wish to address is the impact of social media amongst the youth population and how there are also negatives. For example, it can be used to provide as a megaphone for extremism and other fringe type of opinions. And throughout the last year or so, we noticed a rise in um, right-wing libertarianism. For example, um, um, the, this twist of the notion that free speech means that they can say whatever they feel like without any consequences whatsoever, and any sort of response will be classified as censorship. And um, for example, uh, there is a popular social media platform known as Reddit, where as um, you can create your own, own um, forum to engage in all sorts of hates, where, where if you want to. Um, attack people for being fat, being uh, black, or just simply having um, you know, uh, uh, you know, different opinion, you can do that and without any consequence. And unfortunately, I just noticed that um, this resulted in the harassment of um, people with progressive opinions, that they've been um, labeled as left authoritarianism. And um, so I just feel that for women to, and people of color to um, express um, their opinions on the internet, they face lots of harassment. And um, so, if, especially if they um, don't assume the norm of a um, straight white like, male. So, um, yeah, my question is to say how, um, as left progressives, we can um, tackle this issue. And, um, uh, yeah, and um, yeah, how, especially. Um, <laughs> looking at comment sections and sometimes some people that are followers that have to close their um, comment sections. So yeah, how do you deal with that? Look, uh, um, Freedom Commission. I think the whole sort of notion that you can absolutely abuse anyone and uh, do anything you like and that is somehow free speech. There are real difficulties with that view. On the other hand, if you think you can deal with right-wing libertarianism by simply controlling 
um, the communication on Facebook, you are completely wrong. Yeah, I, I think that these movements exist independently of the communication. Um, obviously, if you're a website like New Matilda, and as I'll pass over to Chris at this point, um, you absolutely have to moderate the comments. Um, you have to, for sort of quite legal reasons, you have to do that. Now, probably within this room, we may have differences around racial vilification, I mean, gender vilification has never even been illegal, for God's sake. You know, you can abuse women as much as you like, and there is absolutely no consequences. Um, so, you know, I always find that a really um, tricky issue. Um, I actually do support the racial vilification laws and think they should be uh, continued. However, I don't actually think it's an answer to racism. And, you know, anyone who thinks it is, I think it's actually having illusions. I, this is an area of particular interest of mine. I, I, yeah, uh, the, the, the National Indigenous Times, I was described by Andrew Bolt as a race warrior. <laughs> and I was described by uh, Miranda Devine as, quote, pure evil, which was the proudest moment of my life. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I still I still feel warm and flustered every time I think about it. That's how I go to sleep every night. Ange would confirm that. Um, I have a particular interest in uh, in how people respond to racism, and I've watched it very very closely on Facebook, and I've been the uh, instigator of much social outrage against uh, the occasional redneck. Um, and as I said before, that's what I really like about uh, Facebook is is the democratic nature of it. And I like the fact that, and I, and I must say, even though I've been quite pessimistic tonight, optimistically I think, uh, I've seen a change in the last few years of people jumping on that sort of racism. And that's what I like about Facebook, that it is increasingly becoming less acceptable. So I'd say keep doing more of that. Could I just say that my tweet on the ICAC and the political donations in the Liberal Party is actually going quite well. It's got 16 retweets, including from Sandy Logan, who used to be the um, PR for the Immigration Department, who I used to have lots of um, interchanges with on Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, could you please go and retweet it? Because um, I'd really like to see the report, the ICAC report on the conspiracy of the Liberals to break their political donation laws. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, it's been a fascinating evening on an incredibly important topic that I think some of us find difficult. My difficulty is with the word friends on, on Facebook because a f about a year ago we had a brilliant young student who had done a, a master's thesis in, all, uh, uh, in of all places, Peshawar in Pakistan. She was looking at the influence of the Pakistani Taliban, incredibly brave. And she came one day to tell me that she had over a thousand friends on Facebook and two days later she committed suicide off the cliffs in Kuji. So my question was, what the hell do you mean by friends in that respect? And I'm, we, it wasn't on the agenda tonight, but the whole interpersonal issue is about the amount of time people have to spend in some ways in kind of absurd narcissistic type endeavours uh, with social media. I really would like that to be unmasked, but Admittedly, that was not part of the agenda. I, I tried, no, <coughs> not, yeah, tried. not part of. Well, it's a, it's a huge issue for for all of us, um, uh, especially for people like me. I've only just graduated from the portable typewriter. <laughs> 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 Probably suicide, anyway. <laughs>